the works of Josephus, the Antiquities of the Jews, Book 2, containing the interval of 220 years from the death of Isaac to the exodus out of Egypt. Chapter 1 How Esau and Jacob, Isaac's sons, divided their habitation, and Esau possessed Idumea, and Jacob Canaan. After the death of Isaac, his sons divided their habitations respectively, nor did they retain what they had before, but Esau departed from the city of Hebron, and left it to his brother, and dwelt in Seir, and ruled over Idumea. He called the country by that name from himself, for he was named Adam, which appellation he got on the following occasion. One day returning from the toil of hunting, very hungry, it was when he was a child in age, he lighted on his brother when he was getting ready lentil pottage for his dinner, which was of a very red color, on which account he the more earnestly longed for it, and desired him to give him some of it to eat. But he made advantage of his brother's hunger, and forced him to resign up to him his birthright, and he, being pinched with famine, resigned it up to him under an oath. Whence it came, that on account of the redness of this pottage, he was, in way of jest, by his contemporaries, called Adam, for the Hebrews call what is red, Adam, and this was the name given to this country, but the Greeks gave it a more agreeable pronunciation and named it Idumia. He became the father of five sons, of whom Jaus and Jalamus and Corius were by one wife, whose name was Alibamah, but of the rest, Eliphaz was born to him by Ada and Raguel by Beshamath, and these were the sons of Esau. Eliphaz had five legitimate sons, Theman, Omer, Saphus, Gotham, and Canaz, for Amalek was not legitimate, but by a concubine whose name was Tamna. These dwelt in that part of Idumea which is called Gabalitis, and that denominated from Amalek, Amalekitis, for Idumea was a large country, and did then preserve the name of the whole, while in its several parts it kept the name of its peculiar inhabitants. Chapter 2 how Joseph, the youngest of Jacob's sons, was envied by his brethren when certain dreams had foreshown his future happiness. It happened that Jacob came to so great happiness as rarely any other person had arrived at. He was richer than the rest of the inhabitants of that country, and was at once envied and admired for such virtuous sons, for they were deficient in nothing, but were of great souls, both for laboring with their hands and enduring of toil and shrewd also in understanding. And God exercised such a providence over him, and such a care of his happiness, as to bring him the greatest blessings, even out of what appeared to be the most sorrowful condition, and to make him the cause of our forefathers' departure out of Egypt, him and his posterity. The occasion was this. When Jacob had his son Joseph born to him by Rachel, his father loved him above the rest of his sons, both because of the beauty of his body and the virtues of his mind for he excelled the rest in prudence. This affection of his father excited the envy and the hatred of his brethren, as did also his dreams which he saw and related to his father and to them, which foretold his future happiness, it being usual with mankind to envy their very nearest relations, such their prosperity. Now the visions which Joseph saw in his sleep were these. When they were in the middle of harvest, and Joseph was sent by his father with his brethren to gather the fruits of the earth, he saw a vision in a dream, but greatly exceeding the accustomary appearances that come when we are asleep, which, when he was got up, he told his brethren that they might judge what it portended. He said he saw the last night, that his wheat sheaf stood still in the place where he set it, but that their sheaves ran to bow down to it, as servants bow down to their masters. But as soon as they perceived the vision foretold, that he should obtain power and great wealth, and that his power should be in opposition to them, they gave no interpretation of it to Joseph, as if the dream were not by them understood. But they prayed that no part of what they suspected to be its meaning might come to pass, and they bear a still greater hatred to him on that account. But God, in opposition to their envy, sent a second vision to Joseph, which was much more wonderful than the former, for it seemed to him that the sun took with him the moon and the rest of the stars, and came down to the earth and bowed down to him. He told the vision to his father, and that 
as suspecting nothing of ill will from his brethren when they were there also, and desired him to interpret what it should signify. Now Jacob was pleased with the dream, for considering the prediction in his mind, and shrewdly and wisely guessing at its meaning, he rejoiced at the great things thereby signified, because it declared the future happiness of his son, and that by the blessing of God the time would come when he should be honored and thought worthy of worship by his parents and brethren, as guessing that the moon and sun were like his mother and father, the former as she that gave increase and nourishment to all things, and the latter he that gave form and other powers to them, and that the stars were like his brethren, since they were eleven in number, as were the stars that received their power from the sun and moon. And thus did Jacob make a judgment of this vision, and that a shrewd one also. But these interpretations caused a very great grief to Joseph's brethren, and they were affected to him hereupon as if he were a certain stranger that was to have those good things which were signified by the dreams, and not as one that was a brother with whom it was probable they should be joint partakers. And as they had been partners in the same parentage, so should they be of the same happiness. They also resolved to kill the lad, and having fully ratified that intention of theirs, as soon as their collection of the fruits was over, they went to Shechem, which is a country good for feeding of cattle and for pasturage. There they fed their flocks, without acquainting their father with their removal thither, whereupon he had melancholy suspicions about them as being ignorant of his son's condition, and receiving no messenger from the flocks that could inform him of the true state they were in. So because he was in great fear about them, he sent Joseph to the flocks to learn the circumstances his brethren were in, and to bring him word how they did. Chapter 3 How Joseph was sold by his brethren into Egypt by reason of their hatred to him, and how he there grew famous and illustrious, and had his brethren under his power. Now these brethren rejoiced as soon as they saw their brother coming to them, not indeed as at the presence of a near relation, or as at the presence of one sent by their father, but as at the presence of an enemy, and one that by divine providence was delivered into their hands, and they already resolved to kill him, and not let slip the opportunity that lay before them. But when Reuben, the eldest of them, saw them thus disposed, and that they had agreed together to execute their purpose, he tried to restrain them, showing them the heinous enterprise they were going about, and the horrid nature of it, that this action would appear wicked in the sight of God, and impious before men, even though they should kill one not related to them, but much more flagitious and detestable to appear to have slain their own brother, by which act the father must be treated unjustly in the son's slaughter, and the mother also be in perplexity while she laments that her son is taken away from her, and this not in a natural way neither. So he entreated them to have a regard to their own consciences, and wisely to consider what mischief would betide them upon the death of so good a child and their youngest brother, that they would also fear God, who was already both a spectator and a witness of the designs they had against their brother, that he would love them if they abstained from this act and yielded to repentance and amendment. But in case they proceeded to do the fact, all sorts of punishment would overtake them from God for this murder of their brother, since they polluted his providence, which was everywhere present, and which did not overlook what was done, either in deserts or in cities. For wheresoever a man is, there ought he to suppose that God is also. He told them further that their consciences would be their enemies if they attempted to go through so wicked an enterprise, which they can never avoid, whether it be a good conscience or whether it be such an one as they will have within their four was resolved on. So they drew Joseph out of the pit and sold him to the merchants for twenty pounds. He was now seventeen years old, but Reuben, coming in the night time to the pit, resolved to save Joseph without the privity of his brethren. And when, upon his calling to him, he made no answer, he was afraid that they had destroyed him after he was gone, of which he complained to his brethren. But when they had told him what they had done, Reuben left off his mourning. When Joseph's brethren had done thus to him, they considered what they should do to escape the suspicions of their father. Now they had taken away from Joseph the coat which he had on when he came to them at the time they let him down into the pit. So they thought proper to tear that coat to pieces and to dip it into goat's blood, and then to carry it and show it to their father that he might believe he was destroyed by wild beasts. And when they had so done, they came to the old man, but this not till what had happened to his son had already come to his knowledge. Then they said that they had not seen Joseph, nor knew what mishap had befallen him, but that they had found his coat bloody and torn to pieces, whence they had a suspicion that he had fallen among wild beasts, and so perished, 
if that was the coat he had on when he came from home. Now Jacob had before some better hopes that his son was only made a captive, but now he laid aside that notion and supposed that this coat was an evident argument that he was dead, for he well remembered that this was the coat he had on when he sent him to his brethren, so he hereafter lamented the lad as now dead, and as if he had been the father of no more than one without taking any comfort in the rest, and so he was also affected with his misfortune before he met with Joseph's brethren, when he also conjectured that Joseph was destroyed by wild beasts. He sat down also clothed in sackcloth and in heavy affliction, insomuch that he found no ease when his sons comforted him, neither did his pains remit by length of time. Chapter 4 Concerning the Signal Chastity of Joseph Now Potiphar, an Egyptian, who was chief cook to King Pharaoh, bought Joseph of the merchants who sold him to him. He had him in the greatest honor, and taught him the learning that became a free man, and gave him leave to make use of a diet better than was allotted to slaves. He entrusted also the care of his house to him. So he enjoyed these advantages, yet did he not leave that virtue which he had before upon such a change of his condition, but he demonstrated that wisdom was able to govern the uneasy passions of life in such as have it in reality, and do not only put it on for a show under a present state of prosperity. For when his master's wife was fallen in love with him, both on account of his beauty of body and his dexterous management of affairs, and supposed that if she should make it known to him, she could easily persuade him to come and lie with her, and that he would look upon it as a piece of happy fortune that his mistress should entreat him, as regarding that state of slavery he was in, and not his moral character, which continued after his condition was changed. So she made known her naughty inclinations, and spake to him about lying with her. However, he rejected her entreaties, not thinking it agreeable to religion to yield so far to her as to do what would tend to the affront and injury of him that purchased him, and had vouchsafed him so great honors. He, on the contrary, exhorted her to govern that passion, and laid before her the impossibility of her obtaining her desires, which he thought might be conquered if she had no hope of succeeding. And he said that as to himself he would endure anything whatever before he would be persuaded to it, for although it was fit for a slave, as he was, to do nothing contrary to his mistress, he might well be excused in a case where the contradiction was to such sort of commands only. But this opposition of Joseph, when she did not expect it, made her still more violent in her love to him. As she was sorely beset with this naughty passion, so she resolved to compass her design by a second attempt. When therefore there was a public festival coming on, in which it was the custom for women to come to the public solemnity, she pretended to her husband that she was sick as contriving an opportunity for solitude and leisure, that she might entreat Joseph again, which opportunity being obtained, she used more kind words to him than before, and said that it had been good for him to have yielded to her first solicitation, and to have given her no repulse, both because of the reverence he ought to bear to her dignity who solicited him, and because of the vehemence of her passion, by which she was forced, though she were his mistress, to condescend beneath her dignity, but that he may now, by taking more prudent advice, wipe off the imputation of his former folly. For whether it were that he expected the repetition of her solicitations she had now made, and that with greater earnestness than before, for that she had pretended sickness on this very account, and had preferred this conversation before the festival and its solemnity, or whether he opposed her former discourses as not believing she could be in earnest, she now gave him sufficient security, by thus repeating her application, that she meant not in the least by fraud to impose upon him, and assured him that if he complied with her affections, he might expect the enjoyment of the advantages he already had, and if he were submissive to her, he should have still greater advantages, but that he must look for revenge and hatred from her in case he rejected her desires and preferred the reputation of chastity before his mistress, for that he would gain nothing by such procedure, because she would then become his accuser and would falsely pretend to her husband that he had attempted her chastity and that Potiphar would hearken to her words rather than to his, let his be ever so agreeable to the truth. When the woman said thus, and even with tears in her eyes, neither did pity dissuade Joseph from his chastity, nor did fear compel him to a compliance with her, but he opposed her solicitations, and did not yield to her threatenings, and was afraid to do an ill thing, and chose to undergo the sharpest punishment rather than to enjoy his present advantages by doing what his own conscience knew would justly deserve that he should die for it. 
He also put her in mind that she was a married woman and that she ought to cohabit with her husband only and desired her to suffer these considerations to have more weight with her than the short pleasure of lustful dalliance which would bring her to repentance afterwards, would cause trouble to her and yet would not amend what had been done amiss. He also suggested to her the fear she would be in lest they should be caught and that the advantage of concealment was uncertain and that only while the wickedness was not known would there be any quiet for them but that she might have the enjoyment of her husband's company without any danger, and he told her that in the company of her husband she might have great boldness from a good conscience, both before God and before men. Nay, that she would act better like his mistress and make use of her authority over him better while she persisted in her chastity than when they were both ashamed for what wickedness they had been guilty of, and that it is much better to depend on a good life well acted and known to have been so than upon the hopes of the concealment of evil practices. Joseph, by saying this, and more, tried to restrain the violent passion of the woman, and to reduce her affections within the rules of reason, but she grew more ungovernable and earnest in the matter, and since she despaired of persuading him, she laid her hands upon him, and had a mind to force him, but as soon as Joseph had got away from her anger, leaving also his garment with her, for he left that to her, and leaped out of her chamber, she was greatly afraid lest he should discover her lewdness to her husband, and greatly troubled at the affront he had offered her. So she resolved to be beforehand with him, and to accuse Joseph falsely to Potiphar, and by that means to revenge herself on him for his pride and contempt of her. And she thought it a wise thing in itself, and also becoming a woman, thus to prevent his accusation. Accordingly, she sat sorrowful in confusion, framing herself so hypocritically and angrily that the sorrow which was really for her being disappointed of her lust might appear to be for the attempt upon her chastity, so that when her husband came home and was disturbed at the sight of her and inquired what was the cause of the disorder she was in, she began to accuse Joseph. And, O oh, husband, said she, mayst thou not live a day longer if thou dost not punish the wicked slave who has desired to defile thy bed, who has neither minded who he was when he came to our house, so as to behave himself with modesty, nor has he been mindful of what favors he had received from thy bounty, as he must be an ungrateful man indeed, unless he, in every respect, carry himself in a manner agreeable to us. This man, I say, laid a private design to abuse thy wife, and this at the time of a festival, observing when thou wouldest be absent, so that it now is clear that his modesty, as it appeared to be formerly, was only because of the restraint he was in out of fear of thee, but that he was not really of a good disposition. This had been occasioned by his being advanced to honor beyond what he deserved and what he hoped for, insomuch that he concluded that he who was deemed fit to be trusted with thy estate and the government of thy family, and was preferred above thy eldest servants, might be allowed to touch thy wife also. Thus when she had ended her discourse, she showed him his garment, as if he then left it with her when he attempted to force her, but Potiphar, not being able to disbelieve what his wife's tears showed, and what his wife said, and what he saw himself, and being seduced by his love to his wife, did not set himself about the examination of the truth, but taking it for granted that his wife was a modest woman, and condemning Joseph as a wicked man, he threw him into the malefactor's prison, and had a still higher opinion of his wife, and bare her witness that she was a woman of becoming modesty and chastity. Chapter 5 what things befell Joseph in prison. Now Joseph, commending all his affairs to God, did not betake himself to make his defense, nor to give an account of the exact circumstances of the fact, but silently underwent the bonds and the distress he was in, firmly believing that God, who knew the cause of his affliction and the truth of the fact, would be more powerful than those that inflicted the punishments upon him, a proof of whose providence he quickly received, for the keeper of the prison taking notice of his care and fidelity in the affairs he had set him about, and the dignity of his countenance, relaxed his bonds, and thereby made his heavy calamity lighter and more supportable to him, he also permitted him to make use of a diet better than that of the rest of the prisoners. Now as his fellow prisoners, when their hard labors were over, fell to discoursing once among another, as is usual in such as are equal sufferers, and to inquire one of another, what were the occasions of their being condemned to a prison? Among them the king's cupbearer, and one that had been respected by him, was put in bonds on the king's anger at him. This man was under the same bonds with Joseph, and grew more familiar with him, and upon him observing that Joseph had a better understanding than the rest had, 
he told him of a dream he had and desired he would interpret its meaning, complaining that besides the afflictions he underwent from the king, God did also add to him trouble from his dreams. He therefore said that in his sleep he saw three clusters of grapes hanging upon three branches of a vine, large already and ripe for gathering, and that he squeezed them into a cup which the king held in his hand, and when he had strained the wine, he gave it to the king to drink, and that he received it from him with a pleasant countenance. This, he said, was what he saw, and he desired Joseph that if he had any portion of understanding in such matters, he would tell him what the vision foretold, who bid him be of good cheer and expect to be loosed from his bonds in three days' time, because the king desired his service and was about to restore him to it again. For he let him know that God bestows the fruit of the vine upon men for good, which wine is poured out to him, and is the pledge of fidelity and mutual confidence among men, and puts an end to their quarrels, takes away passion and grief out of the minds of them that use it, and makes them cheerful. Thou sayest that thou didst squeeze this wine from three clusters of grapes with thine hands, and that the king received it. Know therefore that this vision is for thy good, and foretells a release from thy present distress within the same number of days as the branches had whence thou gatherest thy grapes in thy sleep. However, remember what prosperity I have foretold thee when thou hast found it true by experience, and when thou art in authority, do not overlook us in this prison, wherein thou wilt leave us when thou art gone to the place we have foretold. For we are not in prison for any crime, but for the sake of our virtue and sobriety are we condemned to suffer the penalty of malefactors, and because we are not willing to injure him that has thus distressed us, though it were for our own pleasure. The cupbearer, therefore, as was natural to do, rejoiced to hear such an interpretation of his dream, and waited the completion of what had been thus shown him beforehand. But another servant there was of the king, who had been chief baker, and was now bound in prison with the cupbearer. He also was in good hope upon Joseph's interpretation of the other's vision, for he had seen a dream also, so he desired that Joseph would tell him what the visions he had seen the night before mean. They were these that follow. Methought, says he, I carried three baskets upon my head, two were full of loaves, and the third full of sweet meats and other eatables, such as are prepared for kings, but that the fowls came flying and eat them all up, and had no regard to my attempt to drive them away, and he expected a prediction like to that of the cupbearer. But Joseph, considering and reasoning about the dream, said to him that he would willingly be an interpreter of good events to him, and not of such as his dream denounced to him, but he told him that he had only three days in all to live, for that the three baskets signify that on the third day he should be crucified and devoured by fowls, while he was not able to help himself. Now both these dreams had the same several events that Joseph foretold they should have, and this to both the parties, for on the third day before mentioned, when the king solemnized his birthday, he crucified the chief baker, but set the butler free from his bonds and restored him to his former ministration. But God freed Joseph from his confinement after he had endured his bonds two years and had received no assistance from the cupbearer who did not remember what he had said to him formerly, and God contrived this method of deliverance for him. Pharaoh the king had seen in his sleep the same evening two visions, and after them had the interpretations of them both given him. He had forgotten the latter, but retained the dreams themselves, being therefore troubled at what he had seen, for it seemed to him to be all of a melancholy nature. The next day he called together the wisest men among the Egyptians, desiring to learn from them the interpretation of his dreams, but when they hesitated about them, the king was much the more disturbed. And now it was the memory of Joseph and his skill in dreams came into the mind of the king's cupbearer when he saw the confusion that Pharaoh was in. So he came and mentioned Joseph to him, as also the vision he had seen in prison, and how the event proved as he had said, as also that the chief baker was crucified on the very same day, and that this also happened to him according to the interpretation of Joseph, that Joseph himself was laid on bonds by Potiphar, who was his head cook as a slave, but he said he was one of the noblest of the stock of the Hebrews, and said further his father lived in great splendor. If, therefore, thou wilt send for him, and not despise him on the score of his misfortunes, thou wilt learn what thy dreams signify. So the king commanded that they should bring Joseph into his presence, and those who received the command came and brought him with them, having taken care of his habit, that it might be decent, as the king had enjoined them to do. But the king took him by the hand, and, O young man, says he, 
for my servant bears witness that thou art at present the best and most skillful person I can consult with. Vouchsafe me the same favors which thou bestowedst on this servant of mine, and tell me what events they are which the visions of my dreams foreshow, and I desire thee to suppress nothing out of fear, nor to flatter me with lying words, or with what may please me, although the truth should be of a melancholy nature. For it seemed to me that as I walked by the river, I saw kine, fat and very large, seven in number, going from the river to the marshes, and other kine of the same number like them, met them out of the marshes, exceeding lean and ill-favored, ate up the fat and the large kine, and yet were no better than before, and not less miserably pinched with famine. After I had seen this vision, I awaked out of my sleep, and being in disorder, and considering with myself what this appearance should be, I fell asleep again, and saw another dream, much more wonderful than the foregoing, which still did more affright and disturb me. I saw seven ears of corn growing out of one root, having their heads borne down by the weight of the grains, and bending down with the fruit, which was now ripe and fit for reaping. And near these I saw seven other ears of corn, meager and weak for want of rain, which fell to eating and consuming those that were fit for reaping, and put me into great astonishment. To which Joseph replied, This dream, said he, O king, although seen under two forms, signifies one and the same event of things, for when thou sawest the fat kine, which is an animal made for the plough and for labour, devoured by the worser kine, and the ears of corn eaten up by the smaller ears, they foretell a famine and want of the fruits of the earth for the same number of years, and equal with those when Egypt was in a happy state, and this so far that the plenty of these years will be spent in the same number of years of scarcity, and that scarcity of necessary provisions will be very difficult to be corrected. As a sign whereof, the ill-favored kine, when they had devoured the better sort, could not be satisfied. But still God foreshows what is to come upon men, not to grieve them, but that when they know it beforehand, they may by prudence make the actual experience of what is foretold the more tolerable. If thou, therefore, carefully dispose of the plentiful crops which will come in the former years, thou wilt procure that the future calamity will not be felt by the Egyptians. Hereupon the king wondered at the discretion and wisdom of Joseph, and asked him by what means he might so dispense the foregoing plentiful crops in the happy years as to make the miserable crops more tolerable. Joseph then added this his advice, to spare the good crops and not permit the Egyptians to spend them luxuriously, but to reserve what they would have spent in luxury beyond their necessity against the time of want. He also exhorted him to take the corn of the husbandmen and give them only so much as will be sufficient for their food. Accordingly, Pharaoh being surprised at Joseph, not only for his interpretation of the dream, but for the counsel he had given him, entrusted him with dispensing the corn, with power to do what he thought would be for the benefit of the people of Egypt and for the benefit of the king, as believing that he who first discovered this method of acting would prove the best overseer of it. But Joseph, having this power given him by the king, with leave to make use of his seal and to wear purple, drove in his chariot through all the land of Egypt and took the corn of the husbandmen, allotting as much to everyone as would be sufficient for seed and for food, but without discovering to anyone the reason why he did so. Chapter 6 How Joseph, when he was become famous in Egypt, had his brethren in subjection. Joseph was now grown up to thirty years of age, and enjoyed great honors from the king, who called him Sotom Panek, out of regard to his prodigious degree of wisdom, for that name denotes the revealer of secrets. He also married a wife of very high quality, for he married the daughter of Petephres, one of the priests of Heliopolis. She was a virgin, and her name was Asenath. By her he had children before the scarcity came on, Manasseh, the elder, which signifies forgetful, because his present happiness made him forget his former misfortunes, and Ephraim, the younger, which signifies restored, because he was restored to the freedom of his forefathers. Now after Egypt had happily passed over seven years, according to Joseph's interpretation of the dreams, the famine came upon them in the eighth year, and because this misfortune fell upon them when they had no sense of it beforehand, they were all sorely afflicted by it, and came running to the king's gates, and he called upon Joseph, who sold the corn to them, being become confessedly a savior to the whole multitude of Egyptians. Nor did he open this market of corn for the people of that country only, but strangers had liberty to buy also. 
Joseph being willing that all men who are naturally akin to one another should have assistance from those that lived in happiness. Now Jacob also, when he understood that foreigners might come, sent all his sons into Egypt to buy corn, for the land of Canaan was grievously afflicted with the famine, and this great misery touched the whole continent. He only retained Benjamin, who was born to him by Rachel, and was of the same mother with Joseph. These sons of Jacob then came into Egypt and applied themselves to Joseph, wanting to buy corn, for nothing of this kind was done without his approbation, since even then only was the honor that was paid the king himself advantageous to the persons that paid it, when they took care to honor Joseph also. Now when he well knew his brethren, they thought nothing of him, for he was but a youth when he left them, and was now come to an age so much greater that the lineaments of his face were changed, and he was not known by them. Besides this, the greatness of the dignity wherein he appeared suffered them not so much as to suspect it was he. He now made trial what sentiments they had about affairs of the greatest consequence, for he refused to sell them corn, and said they were come as spies of the king's affairs, and that they came from several countries and joined themselves together, and pretended that they were of kin. It not being possible that a private man should breed up so many sons, and those of so great beauty of countenance as they were, such as an education of so many children being not easily obtained by kings themselves. Now this he did in order to discover what concerned his father, and what happened to him after his own departure from him. And as desiring to know what was become of Benjamin his brother, for he was afraid that they had ventured on the like wicked enterprise against him that they had done to himself, and had taken him off also. Now these brethren of his were under distraction and terror, and thought that very great danger hung over them, yet not at all reflecting upon their brother Joseph, and standing firm under the accusations laid against them, they made their defense by Reuben, the eldest of them, who now became their spokesman. We come not hither, said he, with any unjust design, nor in order to bring any harm to the king's affairs. We only want to be preserved, as supposing your humanity might be a refuge for us from the miseries which our country labors under. We having heard that you propose to sell corn not only to your own countrymen, but to strangers also, and that you determined to allow that corn in order to preserve all that want it, but that we are brethren, and of the same common blood, the peculiar lineaments of our faces, and those not so much different from one another, plainly show. Our father's name is Jacob, an Hebrew man, who had twelve of us for his sons by four wives, which twelve of us, while we were all alive, were a happy family. But when one of our brethren, whose name was Joseph, died, our affairs changed for the worse, for our father could not forbear to make a long lamentation for him, and we are in affliction both by the calamity of the death of our brother and the miserable state of our aged father. We are now therefore come to buy corn, having entrusted the care of our father and the provision for our family to Benjamin, our youngest brother. And if thou sendest to our house, thou mayst learn whether we are guilty of the least falsehood in what we say. And thus did Reuben endeavor to persuade Joseph to have a better opinion of them. But when he had learned from them that Jacob was alive, and that his brother was not destroyed by them, he for the present put them in prison, as intending to examine more into their affairs when he should be at leisure. But on the third day he brought them out and said to them, Since you constantly affirm that you are not come to do any harm to the king's affairs, that you are brethren and the sons of the father whom you named, you will satisfy me of the truth of what you say, if you leave one of your company with me, who shall suffer no injury here. And if, when you have carried corn to your father, you will come to me again, and bring your brother, whom you say you left there along with you, for this shall be by me esteemed an assurance of the truth of what you have told me. Hereupon they were in greater grief than before. They wept, and perpetually deplored one among another the calamity of Joseph, and said they were fallen into this misery as a punishment inflicted by God for what evil contrivances they had against him. And Reuben was large in his reproaches of them, for their too late repentance, whence no prophet arose to Joseph, and earnestly exhorted them to bear with patience whatever they suffered, since it was done by God in way of punishment on this account. Thus they spake to one another, not imagining that Joseph understood their language. A general sadness also seized on them at Reuben's words, and a repentance for what they had done, and they condemned the wickedness they had perpetrated, for which they judged they were justly punished by God. Now when Joseph saw that they were in this distress, he was also affected at it that he fell into tears, and not being willing that they should take notice of him, he retired, and after a while came to them again, and taking Simeon in order to his being a pledge for his brethren's return, he bid them take the corn they had bought, and go their way. 
He also commanded his steward privily to put the money which they had brought with them for the purchase of corn into their sacks, and to dismiss them therewith, who did what he was commanded to do. Now when Jacob's sons were coming to the land of Canaan, they told their father what had happened to them in Egypt, and that they were taken to have come thither as spies upon the king, and how they said they were brethren, and had left their eleventh brother with their father, but were not believed, and how they had left Simeon with the governor until Benjamin should go thither, and be a testimonial of the truth of what they had said. And they begged of their father to fear nothing, but to send the lad along with them. But Jacob was not pleased with anything his sons had done, and he took the detention of Simeon heinously, and thence thought it a foolish thing to give up Benjamin also. Neither did he yield to Reuben's persuasion, though he begged it of him, and gave leave that the grandfather might in wave requital kill his own sons in case any harm came to Benjamin in the journey. So they were distressed and knew not what to do. Nay, there was another accident that still disturbed them more, the money that was found hidden in their sacks of corn. Yet when the corn they had brought failed them, and when the famine still afflicted them, and necessity forced them, Jacob did not still resolve to send Benjamin with his brethren, although there was no returning into Egypt unless they came with what they had promised. Now the misery growing every day worse, and his sons begging it of him, he had no other course to take in his present circumstances. And Judah, who was of a bold temper on other occasions, spake his mind very freely to him, that it did not become him to be afraid on account of his son, nor to suspect the worst, as he did, for nothing could be done to his son but by the appointment of God, which must also for certain come to pass, though he were at home with him, that he ought not to condemn them to such manifest destruction, nor deprive them of that plenty of food they might have from Pharaoh, by his unreasonable fear about his son Benjamin, but ought to take care of the preservation of Simeon, lest by attempting to hinder Benjamin's journey, Simeon should perish. He exhorted him to trust God for him, and said he would either bring his son back to him safe, or together with his, lose his own life, so that Jacob was at length persuaded and delivered Benjamin to them, with the price of the corn doubled. He also sent presents to Joseph of the fruits of the land of Canaan, balsam and rosin, as also turpentine and honey. Now their father shed many tears at the departure of his sons, as well as themselves. His concern was that he might receive them back again safe after their journey, and their concern was that they might find their father well, and no way afflicted with grief for them. And his lamentation lasted a whole day, so that the old man was at last tired with grief and stayed behind. But they went on their way for Egypt, endeavoring to mitigate their grief for their present misfortunes, with the hopes of better success hereafter. As soon as they came into Egypt, they were brought down to Joseph. But here no small fear disturbed them, lest they should be accused about the price of the corn, as if they had cheated Joseph. They then made a long apology to Joseph's steward, and told him that when they came home they found the money in their sacks, and that they had now brought it along with them. He said he did not know what they meant, so they were delivered from that fear. And when he had loosed Simeon, and put him into a handsome habit, he suffered him to be with his brethren, at which time Joseph came from his attendance on the king. So they offered him their presence, and upon his putting the question to them about their father, they answered that they found him well. He also, upon his discovery that Benjamin was alive, asked whether this was their younger brother, for he had seen him. Whereupon they said he was, he replied that God over all was his protector. But when his affection to him made him shed tears, he retired, desiring he might not be seen in that plight by his brethren. Then Joseph took them to supper, and they were set down in the same order as they used to sit at their father's table. And although Joseph treated them all kindly, yet did he send a mess to Benjamin that was double to what the rest of the guests had for their shares. Now when after supper they had composed themselves to sleep, Joseph commanded his steward both to give them their measures of corn and to hide its price again in their sacks, and that withal they should put into Benjamin's sack the golden cup out of which he loved himself to drink, which things he did in order to make trial of his brethren, whether they would stand by Benjamin when he should be accused of having stolen the cup and should appear to be in danger, or whether they would leave him, and depending on their own innocency, go to their father without him. When the servant had done as he was bidden, the sons of Jacob, knowing nothing of all this, went their way, and took Simeon along with them, and had a double cause of joy, both because they had received him again, and because they took back Benjamin to their father, as they had promised. But presently a troop of horsemen encompassed them, and brought them with Joseph's servant, who had put the cup into Benjamin's sack, upon which unexpected attack of the horsemen they were much disturbed, 
and asked what the reason was that they came thus upon men who a little before had been by their lord thought worthy of an honorable and hospitable reception. They replied by calling them wicked wretches who had forgot that very hospitable and kind treatment which Joseph had given them, and did not scruple to be injurious to him, and to carry off that cup out of which he had in so friendly a manner drank to them, and not regarding their friendship with Joseph no more than the danger they should be in if they were taken in comparison of the unjust gain. Hereupon he threatened that they should be punished, for though they had escaped the knowledge of him who was but a servant, yet they had not escaped the knowledge of God, nor had gone off with what they had stolen, and after all asked why we come upon them, as if they knew nothing of the matter, and he told them that they should immediately know it by their punishment. This and more of the same nature did the servant say in way of reproach to them, but they being wholly ignorant of anything here that concerned them, laughed at what he said and wondered at the abuse of language which the servant gave them when he was so hardy as to accuse those who did not before so much as retain the price of their corn which was found in their sacks, but brought it again, though nobody else knew of any such thing, so far were they from offering any injury to Joseph voluntarily. But still, supposing that a search would be a more sure justification of themselves than their own denial of the fact, they bid him search them, and that if any of them had been guilty of the theft, to punish them all. For being no way conscious to themselves of any crime, they spake with assurance, and as they thought, without any danger to themselves also. The servants desired there might be a search made, but they said the punishment should extend to him alone who should be found guilty of the theft. So they made the search, and having searched all the rest, they came last of all to Benjamin, as knowing it was Benjamin's sack in which they had hidden the cup, they having indeed searched the rest only for a show of accuracy. So the rest were out of fear for themselves, and were now only concerned about Benjamin, but were still well assured that he would also be found innocent, and they reproached those that came after them for their hindering them while they might, in the meanwhile, have gotten a good way on their journey. But as soon as they searched Benjamin's sack, they found the cup and took it from him, and all was changed into mourning and lamentation. They rent their garments and wept for the punishment which their brother was to undergo for his theft, and for the delusion they had put on their father when they promised they would bring Benjamin safe to him. What added to their misery was that this melancholy accident came unfortunately at a time when they thought they had been gotten off clear, but they confessed that this misfortune of their brother as well as the grief of their father for him, was owing to themselves, since it was they that forced their father to send him with them when he was averse to it. The horsemen therefore took Benjamin and brought him to Joseph, his brethren also following him, who when he saw him in custody, and them in the habit of mourners, said, How came you, vile wretches as you are, to have such a strange notion of my kindness to you, and of God's providence, as impudently to do thus to your benefactor, who in such an hospitable manner had entertained you, Whereupon they gave up themselves to be punished in order to save Benjamin, and called to mind what a wicked enterprise they had been guilty of against Joseph. They also pronounced him more happy than themselves if he were dead in being freed from the miseries of this life, and if he were alive that he enjoyed the pleasure of seeing God's vengeance upon them. They said further that they were the plague of their father since they should now add to his former affliction for Joseph this other affliction for Benjamin. Reuben was also large in cutting them upon this occasion. But Joseph dismissed them, for he said they had been guilty of no offense, and that he would content himself with the lad's punishment, for he said it was not a fit thing to let him go free for the sake of those who had not offended, nor was it a fit thing to punish them together with him who had been guilty of stealing. And when he promised to give them leave to go away in safety, the rest of them were under great consternation and were able to say nothing on this sad occasion. But Judah, who had persuaded their father to send the lad from him, being otherwise also a very bold and active man, determined to hazard himself for the preservation of his brother. It is true, said he, O governor, that we have been very wicked with regard to thee, and on that account deserve punishment. Even all of us may justly be punished, although the theft were not committed by all, but only by one of us, and he the youngest also. But yet there remains some hope for us, who otherwise must be under despair on his account, and this from thy goodness which promises us a deliverance out of our present danger. And now, I beg thou wilt not look at us, or at that great crime we have been guilty of, but at thy own excellent nature, and take advice of thine own virtue, instead of that wrath thou hast against us, which passion those that otherwise are of lower character indulge, as they do their strength, and that not only on great, but also on very trifling occasions. Overcome, sir, that passion, and be not subdued by it, nor suffer it to slay those that do not otherwise presume upon their own safety, but are desirous to accept of it from thee. For this is not the first time that thou wilt bestow it on us, but before, when we came to buy corn, 
thou affordest us great plenty of food, and gavest us leave to carry so much home to our family, as has preserved them from perishing by famine. Nor is there any difference between not overlooking men that were perishing for want of necessaries, and not punishing those that seem to be offenders, and have been so unfortunate as to lose the advantage of that glorious benefaction which they received from thee. This will be an instance of equal favor, though bestowed after a different manner. For thou wilt save those this way whom thou didst feed the other, and thou wilt hereby preserve alive, by thy own bounty, those souls which thou didst not suffer to be distressed by famine, it being indeed at once a wonderful and a great thing to sustain our lives by corn, and to bestow on us that pardon whereby now we are distressed, we may continue those lives. And I am ready to suppose that God is willing to afford thee this opportunity of showing thy virtuous disposition by bringing us into this calamity, that it may appear thou canst forgive the injuries that are done to thyself, and mayst be esteemed kind to others, besides those who on other accounts stand in need of thy assistance since it is indeed a right thing to do well to those who are in distress for want of food, but still a more glorious thing to save those who deserve to be punished, when it is on account of heinous offenses against thyself. For if it be a thing deserving commendation to forgive such as have been guilty of small offenses that tend to a person's loss, and this be praiseworthy in him that overlooks such offenses, to restrain a man's passion as to crimes which are capital to the guilty, is to be like the most excellent nature of God himself. And truly, as for myself, had it not been that we had a father who had discovered on occasion of the death of Joseph how miserably he is always afflicted at the loss of his sons, I had not made any words on account of the saving of our own lives, I mean, any further than as that would be an excellent character for thyself to preserve even those that would have nobody to lament them when they were dead, but we would have yielded ourselves up to suffer whatsoever thou pleasedst. But now, for we do not plead for mercy to ourselves, though indeed, if we die, it will be while we are young, and before we have had the enjoyment of life, have regard to our father, and take pity of his old age, on whose account it is that we make these supplications to thee. We beg thou wilt give us those lives which this wickedness of ours has rendered obnoxious to thy punishment, and this for his sake, who is not himself wicked, nor does his being our father make us wicked. He is a good man, and not worthy to have such trials of his patience, and now we are absent, he is afflicted with care for us, but if he hear of our deaths, and what was the cause of it, he wilt on that account die an immature death and with the reproachful manner of our ruin will hasten his end, and will directly kill him, nay, will bring him into a miserable death, while he will make haste to rid himself out of the world, and bring himself to a state of insensibility, before the sad story of our end come abroad into the rest of the world. Consider these things in this manner, although our wickedness does now provoke thee with a just desire of punishing that wickedness, and forgive it for our father's sake, and let thy commiseration of him weigh more than thee with our wickedness, have regard to the old age of our father, who, if we perish, will be very lonely while he lives, and will soon die himself also. Grant this boon to the name of fathers, for thereby thou wilt honor him that begat thee, and will grant it to thyself also, who enjoyest already that denomination. Thou wilt then, by that denomination, be preserved of God, the Father of all, by showing us a pious regard, to which in the case of our father thou wilt appear to honor him who is styled by the same name. I mean... If thou wilt have this pity on our father, upon this consideration, how miserable he will be if he be deprived of his sons. It is their part, therefore, to bestow on us what God has given us, when it is in thy power to take it away, and so to resemble him entirely in charity. For it is good to use that power, which can either give or take away, on the merciful side, and when it is in thy power to destroy, to forget that thou ever hadst that power, and to look on thyself as only allowed power for preservation and that the more any one extends this power, the greater reputation does he gain to himself. Now by forgiving our brother what he has unhappily committed, thou wilt preserve us all, for we cannot think of living if he be put to death, since we dare not show ourselves alive to our father without our brother. But here must we partake of one and the same catastrophe of his life. And so far we beg of thee, O governor, that if thou condemnest our brother to die, thou wilt punish us together with him as partakers of his crime." For we shall not think it reasonable to be preserved to kill ourselves for grief of our brother's death, but so to die rather as equally guilty with him of this crime. I will only leave thee with this one consideration, and then will say no more. That our brother committed his fault when he was young, and not yet confirmed wisdom in this conduct, and that men naturally forgive such young persons. I end here without adding what more I have to say, that in case thou condemnest us, that omission may be supposed to have hurt us and permitted thee to take the severer side. But in case thou settest us free, that this may be ascribed to thy own goodness, 
of which thou art inwardly conscious that thou freest us from condemnation, and that not by barely preserving us, but by granting us such a favor as will make us appear more righteous than we really are, and by representing to thyself more motives for our deliverance than we are able to produce ourselves. If, therefore, thou resolvest to slay him, I desire thou wilt slay me in his stead, and send him back to his father. Or if thou pleasest to retain him with thee as a slave, I am fitter to labor for thy advantage in that capacity, and as thou seest, I am better prepared for either of those sufferings. So Judah, being very willing to undergo anything, whatever for the deliverance of his brother, cast himself down at Joseph's feet, and earnestly labored to assuage and pacify his anger. All his brethren also fell down before him, weeping and delivering themselves up to destruction for the preservation of the life of Benjamin. But Joseph, as overcome now with his affections, and no longer able to personate an angry man, commanded all that were present to depart, that he might make himself known to his brethren when they were alone. And when the rest were gone out, he made himself known to his brethren, and said, I commend you for your virtue and your kindness to our brother. I find you better men than I could have expected from what you contrived about me. Indeed, I did all this to try your love to your brother, so I believe you were not wicked by nature in what you did in my case, but that all has happened according to God's will, who has hereby procured our enjoyment of what good things we have, and if he continue in a favorable disposition of what we hope for hereafter. Since therefore I know that our father is safe and well, beyond expectation, and I see you so well disposed to your brother, I will no longer remember what guilt you seem to have had about me, but will leave off to hate you for that your wickedness, and do rather return you my thanks that you have concurred with the intentions of God to bring things to their present state. I would have you also rather to forget the same, since that imprudence of yours is come to such a happy conclusion, than to be uneasy and blush at those your offenses. Do not, therefore, let your evil intentions, when you condemned me, and that bitter remorse which might follow, be a grief to you now, because those intentions were frustrated. Go therefore your way, rejoicing in what has happened by the divine providence, and inform your father of it, lest he should be spent with cares for you, and deprive me of the most agreeable part of my felicity. I mean, lest he should die before he comes into my sight, and enjoys the good things that we now have. Bring therefore with you our father, and your wives and children, and all your kindred, and remove your habitations hither, for it is not proper that the persons dearest to me should live remote from me. Now my affairs are so prosperous, especially when they must endure five more years of famine. When Joseph had said this, he embraced his brethren, who were in tears and sorrow, but the generous kindness of their brother seemed to leave among them no room for fear, lest they should be punished on account of what they had consulted and acted against him, and they were then feasting. Now the king, as soon as he heard that Joseph's brethren were come to him, was exceeding glad of it, as if it had been a part of his own good fortune, and gave them wagons full of corn and gold and silver to be conveyed to his father. Now when they had received more of their brother, part to be carried to their father, and part as free gifts to every one of themselves, Benjamin having still more than the rest, they departed. Chapter 7 The removal of Joseph's father, with all his family to him, on account of the famine. As soon as Jacob came to know, by his son's returning home, in what state Joseph was, that he had not only escaped death, for which yet he lived all along in mourning, but that he lived in splendor and happiness, and ruled over Egypt jointly with the king, and had entrusted to his care almost all his affairs, he did not think anything he was told to be incredible, considering the greatness of the words of God and his kindness to him, although that kindness had for some late times been intermitted, so he immediately and zealously set out upon his journey to him. When he came to the well of the oath, Beersheba, he offered sacrifice to God, and being afraid that the happiness there was in Egypt might tempt his posterity to fall in love with it and settle in it, and no more think of removing into the land of Canaan and possessing it as God had promised them, as also being afraid, lest, if this descent into Egypt were made without the will of God, his family might be destroyed there, out of fear, withal, lest he should depart this life before he came to the sight of Joseph, he fell asleep, revolving these doubts in his mind. But God stood by him, and called him twice by his name, and when he asked who he was, God said, No, sure, it is not just that thou, Jacob, shouldest be unacquainted with that God who has ever been a protector and a helper to thy forefathers, and after them to thyself. 
For when thy father would have deprived thee of the dominion, I gave it thee, and by my kindness it was that when thou wast sent into Mesopotamia all alone, thou obtainedst good wives, and returnest with many children and much wealth. Thy whole family also has been preserved by my providence, and it was I who conducted Joseph, thy son, whom thou gavest up for lost, to the enjoyment of great prosperity. I also made him lord of Egypt, so that he differs but little from a king. Accordingly, I come now as a guide to thee in this journey, and foretell to thee that thou shalt die in the arms of Joseph, and I inform thee that thy posterity shall be many ages in authority and glory, and that I will settle them in the land which I have promised them. Jacob, encouraged by this dream, went on more cheerfully for Egypt with his sons and all belonging to them. Now they were in all seventy. I, once indeed, thought it best not to set down the names of this family, especially because of their difficult pronunciation by the Greeks, but upon the whole, I think it necessary to mention those names that I may disprove such as believe that we came not originally from Mesopotamia, but are Egyptians. Now Jacob had twelve sons. Of these Joseph was come thither before. We will therefore set down the names of Jacob's children and grandchildren. Reuben had four sons, Enoch, Phalu, Aseron, Carmi, Simeon had six, Jamuel, Jamin, Avod, Jachin, Soar, Saul, Levi had three sons, Gersom, Kaath, Merari, Judah had three sons, Selah, Phares, Zerah, and by Phares two grandchildren, Esram and Amar. Issachar had four sons, Thola, Pua, Jasub, Samaron. Zabulon had with him three sons, Sarad, Helon, Jalel, so far as the posterity of Leah, with whom went her daughter, Dina. These are thirty-three. Rachel had two sons, the one of whom, Joseph, had two sons also, Manassas and Ephraim. The other, Benjamin, had ten sons, Bolau, Bekar, Asabel, Giras, Naaman, Jess, Ras, Momphis, Ophis, Arad, these fourteen added to the thirty-three before enumerated amount to the number forty-seven, and this was the legitimate posterity of Jacob. He had besides, by Bilhah, the handmaid of Rachel, Dan and Nephtali, which last had four sons that followed him, Jasel, Gunai, Isari, and Selim. Dan had an only begotten son, Usai. If these be added to those before mentioned, they complete the number fifty-four. Gad and Asher were the sons of Zilpah, who was the handmaid of Leah. These had with them Gad, seven, Saphaniah, Agis, Sunis, Azabon, Aaron, Eroid, Ariel. Asher had a daughter, Sarah, and six male children, whose names were Jomni, Isis, Isui, Baris, Abar, and Melchiel. If we add these, which are sixteen, to the fifty-four, the forementioned number, seventy, is completed, Jacob not being himself included in that number. When Joseph understood that his father was coming, for Judah his brother was come before him and informed him of his approach, he went out to meet him, and they met together at Heliopolis. But Jacob almost fainted away at this unexpected and great joy. However, Joseph revived him being yet not himself able to contain from being affected in the same manner at the pleasure he now had, yet he was not wholly overcome with his passion as his father was. After this, he desired Jacob to travel on slowly, but he himself took five of his brethren with him and made haste to the king to tell him that Jacob and his family were come, which was a joyful hearing to him. He also bid Joseph tell him what sort of life his brethren loved to lead, that he might give them leave to follow the same who told him they were good shepherds and had been used to follow no other employment but this alone, whereby he provided for them that they should not be separated but live in the same place and take care of their father, as also hereby he provided that they might be acceptable to the Egyptians by doing nothing that would be common to them with the Egyptians, for the Egyptians are prohibited to meddle with feeding of sheep. When Jacob was come to the king and saluted him and wished him all prosperity to his government, 
Pharaoh asked him how old he was, upon whose answer that he was an hundred and thirty years old. He admired Jacob on account of the length of his life, and when he had added that still he had not lived so long as his forefathers, he gave him leave to live with his children in Heliopolis, for in that city the king's shepherds had their pasturage. However, the famine increased among the Egyptians, and this heavy judgment grew more oppressive to them, because neither did the river overflow the ground, for it did not rise to its former height, nor did God send rain upon it, nor did they indeed make the least provision for themselves, so ignorant were they what was to be done, but Joseph sold them corn for their money. But when their money failed them, they bought corn with their cattle and their slaves, and if any of them had a small piece of land, they gave up that to purchase them food, by which means the king became the owner of all their substance, and they were removed, some to one place and some to another, that so the possession of their country might be firmly assured to the king, accepting the lands of the priests, for their country continued still in their own possession. And indeed, this sore famine made their minds as well as their bodies slaves, and at length compelled them to procure a sufficiency of food by such dishonorable means. But when this misery ceased, and the river overflowed the ground, and the ground brought forth its fruits plentifully, Joseph came to every city, and gathered the people thereto belonging together, and gave them back entirely the land which by their own consent the king might have possessed alone, and alone enjoyed the fruits of it. He also exhorted them to look on it as everyone's own possession, and to fall to their husbandry with cheerfulness, and to pay as a tribute to the king the fifth part of the fruits for the land which the king, when it was his own, restored to them. These men rejoiced upon their becoming unexpectedly owners of their lands, and diligently observed what was enjoined them, and by this means Joseph procured to himself a greater authority among the Egyptians, and greater love to the king from them. Now this law, that they should pay the fifth part of their fruits as a tribute, continued until their later kings. Chapter 8 The Death of Jacob and Joseph Now when Jacob had lived seventeen years in Egypt, he fell into a disease and died in the presence of his sons, but not till he made his prayers for their enjoying prosperity, and till he had foretold them prophetically how every one of them was to dwell in the land of Canaan. But this happened many years afterward. He also enlarged upon the praises of Joseph, how he had not remembered the evil doings of his brethren to their disadvantage, nay, on the contrary, was kind to them, bestowing upon them so many benefits as seldom are bestowed on men's own benefactors. He then commanded his own sons that they should admit Joseph's sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, into their number, and divide the land of Canaan in common with them, concerning whom we shall treat hereafter. However, he made it his request that he might be buried at Hebron. So he died, when he had lived full a hundred and fifty years, three only abated, having not been behind any of his ancestors in piety towards God, and having such a recompense for it, as it was fit those should have who were so good as these were. But Joseph, by the king's permission, carried his father's dead body to Hebron, and there buried it at a great expense. Now his brethren were at first unwilling to return back with him, because they were afraid, lest now their father was dead, he should punish them for their secret practices against him, since he was now gone, for whose sake he had been so gracious to them. But he persuaded them to fear no harm, and to entertain no suspicions of him. So he brought them along with him, and gave them great possessions, and never left off his particular concern for them. Joseph also died when he had lived a hundred and ten years, having been a man of admirable virtue, and conducting all his affairs by the rules of reason, and used his authority with moderation, which was the cause of his so great felicity among the Egyptians, even when he came from another country, and that in such ill circumstances also, as we have already described. At length his brethren died, after they had lived happily in Egypt. Now the posterity and sons of these men, after some time, carried their bodies and buried them at Hebron. But as to the bones of Joseph, they carried them into the land of Canaan afterward, when the Hebrews went out of Egypt, for so had Joseph made them promise him upon oath. But what became of every one of these men, and by what toils they got the possessions of the land of Canaan, shall be shown hereafter, when I have first explained upon what account it was that they left Egypt. Chapter 9 Concerning the Afflictions that Befell the Hebrews in Egypt During Four Hundred Years now it happened that the Egyptians grew delicate and lazy, 
and as to painstaking and gave themselves up to other pleasures, and in particular to the love of gain. They also became very ill-affected towards the Hebrews, as touched with envy at their prosperity. For when they saw how the nation of the Israelites flourished and were become eminent already in plenty of wealth, which they had acquired by their virtue and natural love of labor, they thought their increase was to their own detriment, and having in the length of time forgotten the benefits they had received from Joseph, particularly the crown being now come into another family, they became very abusive to the Israelites and contrived many ways of afflicting them, for they enjoined them to cut a great number of channels for the river and to build walls for their cities and ramparts that they might restrain the river and hinder its waters from stagnating upon running over its own banks. They set them also to build pyramids and by all this wore them out and forced them to learn all sorts of mechanical arts and to accustom themselves to hard labor and four hundred years did they spend under these afflictions, for they strove one against the other which should get the mastery, the Egyptians desiring to destroy the Israelites by these labors, and the Israelites desiring to hold out to the end under them. While the affairs of the Hebrews were in this condition, there was this occasion offered itself to the Egyptians which made them more solicitous for the extinction of our nation. One of those sacred scribes, who are very sagacious in foretelling future events truly, told the king that about this time, there would a child be born to the Israelites, who if he were reared would bring the Egyptian dominion low, and would raise the Israelites, that he would excel all men in virtue, and obtain a glory that would be remembered through all ages. Which thing was so feared by the king, that according to this man's opinion, he commanded that they should cast every male child which was born to the Israelites into the river and destroy it. That besides this, the Egyptian midwives should watch the labors of the Hebrew women, and observe what is born, for those were the women who were enjoined to do the office of midwives to them, and by reason of their relation to the king would not transgress his commands. He enjoined also that if any parents should disobey him and venture to save their male children alive, they and their families should be destroyed. This was a severe affliction indeed to those that suffered it, not only as they were deprived of their sons, and while they were the parents themselves, they were obliged to be subservient to the destruction of their own children, but as it was to be supposed to tend to the expiration of their nation, while upon the destruction of their children and their own gradual dissolution, the calamity would become very hard and inconsolable to them. And this was the ill state they were in. But no one can be too hard for the purpose of God, though he contrived ten thousand subtle devices for that end. For this child, whom the sacred scribe foretold, was brought up and concealed from the observers appointed by the king, and he that foretold him did not mistake in the consequences of his preservation which were brought to pass after the manner following. A man whose name was Amram, one of the nobler sort of the Hebrews, was afraid for his whole nation, lest it should fail by the want of young men to be brought up hereafter, and was very uneasy at it, his wife being then with child, and he knew not what to do. Hereupon he betook himself to prayer to God, and entreated him to have compassion on those men who had no wise transgressed the laws of his worship, and to afford them deliverance from the miseries they at that time endured, and to render abortive their enemies' hopes of the destruction of their nation. Accordingly, God had mercy on him, and was moved by his supplication. He stood by him in his sleep, and exhorted him not to despair of his future favorites. He said further, that he did not forget their piety towards him, and would always reward them for it, as he had formerly granted his favor to their forefathers, and made them increase from a few to so great a multitude. He put him in mind that when Abraham was come alone out of Mesopotamia into Canaan, he had been made happy, not only in other respects, but that when his wife was at first barren, she was afterwards by him enabled to conceive seed and bear him sons, that he left to Ishmael and to his posterity the country of Arabia, as also to his sons by Keturah, Trogloditis, and to Isaac, Canaan, that by my assistance, said he, he did great exploits in war, which unless you be yourselves impious, you must still remember. As for Jacob, he became well known to strangers also, by the greatness of that prosperity in which he lived, and left to his sons, who came into Egypt with no more than seventy souls, while you are now become above six hundred thousand. Know therefore that I shall provide for you in all common what is for your good, and particularly for thyself, what shall make thee famous. For that child, out of dread of whose nativity the Egyptians have doomed the Israelite children to destruction, shall be this child of thine, and shall be concealed from those who watch to destroy him. And when he is brought up in a surprising way, he shall deliver the Hebrew nation from the distress they are under from the Egyptians. His memory shall be famous while the world lasts, 
and this not only among the Hebrews, but foreigners also, all which shall be the effect of my favor to thee, and to thy posterity. He shall also have such a brother, that he shall himself obtain my priesthood, and his posterity shall have it after him to the end of the world. When the vision had informed him of these things, Amram awaked and told it to Jochebed, who was his wife, and now the fear increased upon them on account of the prediction in Amram's dream, for they were under concern not only for the child, but on account of the great happiness that was to come to him also. However, the mother's labor was such as afforded a confirmation to what was foretold by God, for it was not known to those that watched her by the easiness of her pains, and because the throes of her delivery did not fall upon her with violence, and now they nourished the child at home privately for three months. But after that time, Amram, fearing he should be discovered, and by falling under the king's displeasure, both he and his child should perish, and so he should make the promise of God of none effect, he determined rather to entrust the safety and care of the child to God, than to depend on his own concealment of him, which he looked upon as a thing uncertain, and whereby both the child, so privately to be nourished, and himself, should be in imminent danger." But he believed that God would some way for certain procure the safety of the child in order to secure the truth of his own predictions. When they had thus determined, they made an ark of bulrushes after the manner of a cradle and of a bigness sufficient for an infant to be laid in without being too straightened. Then they daubed it over with slime, which would naturally keep out the water from entering between the bulrushes, and put the infant into it, and setting it afloat upon the river, they left its preservation to God. So the river received the child and carried him along. But Miriam, the child's sister, passed along upon the bank over against him, as her mother had bid her, to see whither the ark would be carried, where God demonstrated that human wisdom was nothing, but that the Supreme Being is able to do whatsoever he pleases, that those who in order to their own security condemn others to destruction, and use great endeavors about it, fail of their purpose, but that others are in a surprising manner preserved, and obtain a prosperous condition, almost from the very midst of their calamities. Those, I mean, whose dangers arise by the appointment of God, and indeed, such a providence was exercised in the case of this child, as showed the power of God. Thermutis was the king's daughter. She was now diverting herself by the banks of the river, and seeing a cradle borne along the current, she sent some that could swim, and bid them bring the cradle to her. When those that were sent on this errand came to her with the cradle, and she saw the little child, she was greatly in love with it, on account of its largeness and beauty. For God had taken such great care in the formation of Moses that he caused him to be thought worthy of bringing up and providing for by all those that had taken the most fatal resolutions on account of the dread of his nativity for the destruction of the rest of the Hebrew nation. Thermutus bid them bring her a woman that might afford her breast to the child, yet would not the child admit of her breast, but turned away from it and did the like to many other women. Now Miriam was by when this happened, not to appear to be there on purpose, but only as staying to see the child. And she said, It is in vain that thou, O queen, callest for these women for the nourishing of the child, who are in no way of kin to it. But still, if thou wilt order one of the Hebrew women to be brought, perhaps it may admit the breast of one of its own nation. Now since she seemed to speak well, Thermutus bid her procure such a one, and to bring one of those Hebrew women that gave suck, so when she had such authority given her, she came back and brought the mother, who was known to nobody there. And now the child gladly admitted the breast, and seemed to stick close to it. And so it was, that at the queen's desire, the nursing of the child was entirely entrusted to the mother. Hereupon it was, that Thermutus imposed this name, Moses, upon him, from what had happened when he was put into the river. For the Egyptians call water by the name of Mo, and such as are saved out of it, by the name of Usus. So by putting these words together, they imposed this name upon him, and he was, by the confession of all, according to God's prediction, as well as his greatness of mind, as for his contempt of difficulties, the best of all the Hebrews, for Abraham was his ancestor of the seventh generation, for Moses was the son of Amram, who was the son of Kaath, whose father Levi was the son of Jacob, who was the son of Isaac, who was the son of Abraham. Now Moses' understanding became superior to his age, nay, far beyond that standard, and when he was taught, he discovered greater quickness of apprehension than was usual at his age, and his actions at that time promised greater when he should come to the age of a man. God did also give him that tallness when he was but three years old, as was wonderful, and as for his beauty, there was nobody so unpolite as when they saw Moses, they were not greatly surprised at the beauty of his countenance. Nay, 
it happened frequently that those that met him as he was carried along the road were obliged to turn again upon seeing the child, that they left what they were about and stood still a great while to look on him, for the beauty of the child was so remarkable and natural to him on many accounts that it detained the spectators and made them stay longer to look upon him. Thermutus, therefore, perceiving him to be so remarkable a child, adopted him for her son, having no child of her own, and when one time she had carried Moses to her father, she showed him to him, and said she thought to make him her father's successor, if it should please God, she should have no legitimate child of her own, and said to him, I have brought up a child who is of a divine form, and of a generous mind, and as I have received him from the bounty of the river, in a wonderful manner, I thought proper to adopt him for my son, and the heir of thy kingdom. And when she had said this, she put the infant into her father's hands, so he took him, and hugged him close to his breast, and on his daughter's account, in a pleasant way, put his diadem upon his head. But Moses threw it down to the ground, and in a puerile mode, he wreathed it round, and trod upon it with his feet, which seemed to bring along with it an evil presage concerning the kingdom of Egypt. But when the sacred scribe saw this, he was the same person who foretold that this nativity would bring the dominion of that kingdom low. He made a violent attempt to kill him, and crying out in a frightful manner, he said, This, O king, this child is he of whom God foretold, that if we kill him we shall be in no danger. He himself affords an attestation to the prediction of the same thing, by his trampling upon thy government, and treading upon thy diadem. Take him, therefore, out of the way, and deliver the Egyptians from the fear that they are in about him, and deprive the Hebrews of the hope they have of being encouraged by him. But Thermutus prevented him, and snatched the child away, and the king was not hasty to slay him, God himself whose providence protected Moses, inclining the king to spare him. He was therefore educated with great care, so the Hebrews depended on him, and were of good hopes that great things would be done by him. But the Egyptians were suspicious of what would follow such his education. Yet because, if Moses had been slain, there was no one, either akin or adopted, that had any oracle on his side for pretending to the crown of Egypt, and likely to be of greater advantage to them, they abstained from killing him. Chapter 10 How Moses Made War with the Ethiopians Moses, therefore, when he was born, and brought up in the foregoing manner, and came to the age of maturity, made his virtue manifest to the Egyptians, and showed that he was born for the bringing them down, and raising the Israelites, and the occasion he laid hold of was this. The Ethiopians, who were next neighbors to the Egyptians, made an inroad into their country, which they seized upon, and carried off the effects of the Egyptians, who in their rage fought against them, and revenged the affronts they had received from them. But being overcome in battle, some of them were slain, and the rest ran away in a shameful manner, and by that means saved themselves. Whereupon the Ethiopians followed after them in the pursuit, and thinking that it would be a mark of cowardice if they did not subdue all Egypt, they went on to subdue the rest with greater vehemence, and when they had tasted the sweets of the country, they never left off the prosecution of the war, and as the nearest parts had not courage enough at first to fight with them, they proceeded as far as Memphis and the sea itself, while not one of the cities was able to oppose them. The Egyptians, under this sad oppression, betook themselves to their oracles and prophecies, and when God had given them this counsel to make use of Moses the Hebrew and take his assistance, the king commanded his daughter to produce him that he might be the general of their army. Upon which, when she made him swear that he would do him no harm, she delivered him to the king, and supposed his assistance would be of great advantage to them. She withal reproached the priest, who when they had before admonished the Egyptians to kill him, was not ashamed now to own their want of his help. So Moses, at the persuasion of both Thermutus and the king himself, cheerfully undertook the business, and the sacred scribes of both nations were glad, those of the Egyptians, that they should at once overcome their enemies by his valor, and that by the same piece of management, Moses would be slain. But those of the Hebrews, that they should escape from the Egyptians, because Moses was to be their general. But Moses prevented the enemies, and took and led his army before those enemies were apprised of his attacking them. For he did not march by the river, but by land, where he gave a wonderful demonstration of his sagacity. For when the ground was difficult to be passed over, because of the multitude of serpents, which it produces in vast numbers, and indeed is singular in some of those productions, which other countries do not breed, and yet 
such as are worse than other countries in power and mischief, and in unusual fierceness of sight, some of which ascend out of the ground unseen, and also fly in the air, and do come upon men at unawares, and do them a mischief. Moses invented a wonderful stratagem to preserve the army safe and without hurt, for he made baskets like unto arks of sedge, and filled them with ibis, and carried them along with them, which animal is the greatest enemy to serpents imaginable, for they fly from them when they come near them, and as they fly they are caught and devoured by them as if it were done by the hearts. But the ibis are tame creatures, and only enemies to the serpentine kind, but about these ibis I say no more at present, since the Greeks themselves are not acquainted with this sort of bird. As soon, therefore, as Moses was come to the land which was the breeder of these serpents, he let loose the ibis, and by their means repelled the serpentine kind, and used them for his assistance before the army came upon that ground. When he had therefore proceeded thus on his journey, he came upon the Ethiopians before they had expected him, and joining battle with them, he beat them, and deprived them of the hopes they had of success against the Egyptians, and went on in overthrowing their cities, and indeed made a great slaughter of these Ethiopians. Now when the Egyptian army had once tasted of this prosperous success by the means of Moses, they did not slacken their diligence, insomuch that the Ethiopians were in danger of being reduced to slavery and all sorts of destruction, and at length they retired to Saba, which was a royal city of Ethiopia, which Cambyses, afterwards named Miro, after the name of his own sister, the place was to be besieged with very great difficulty, since it was both encompassed by the Nile, quite round, and the other rivers, Astapus and Astaborus, made it a very difficult thing for such as attempted to pass over them, for the city was situate in a retired place, and was inhabited after the manner of an island, being encompassed with a strong wall, and having the rivers to guard them from their enemies, and having great rampers between the wall and the rivers, insomuch that when the waters came with the greatest violence, it can never be drowned, which ramparts make it next to impossible for even such as are gotten over the rivers to take the city. However, while Moses was uneasy at the armies lying idle, for the enemies durst not come to a battle, this accident happened. Tharbis was the daughter of the king of the Ethiopians. She happened to see Moses as he led the army near the walls, and fought with great courage, and admiring the subtility of his undertakings, and believing him to be the author of the Egyptians' success, when they had before despaired of recovering their liberty, and to be the occasion of the great danger the Ethiopians were in, when they had before boasted of their great achievements, she fell deeply in love with him, and upon the prevalency of that passion, sent to him the most faithful of all her servants to discourse with him about their marriage. He thereupon accepted the offer, on condition she would procure the delivering up of the city, and gave her the assurance of an oath to take her to his wife, and that when he had once taken possession of the city, he would not break his oath to her. No sooner was the agreement made, but it took effect immediately, and when Moses had cut off the Ethiopians, he gave thanks to God, and consummated his marriage, and led the Egyptians back to their own land. Chapter 11 How Moses Fled Out of Egypt Into Midian Now the Egyptians, after they had been preserved by Moses, entertained a hatred to him, and were very eager in compassing their designs against him, as suspecting that he would take occasion from his good success to raise a sedition and bring innovations into Egypt, and told the king he ought to be slain. The king had also some intentions of himself to the same purpose, and this as well out of envy at his glorious expedition at the head of his army, as out of fear of being brought low by him, and being instigated by the sacred scribes, he was ready to undertake to kill Moses, but when he had learned beforehand what plots there were against him, he went away privately, and because the public roads were watched, he took his flight through the deserts, and where his enemies could not suspect he would travel. And though he was destitute of food, he went on, and despised that difficulty courageously. And when he came to the city of Midian, which lay upon the Red Sea, and was so denominated from one of Abraham's sons by Keturah, he sat upon a certain well, and rested himself there after his laborious journey, and the affliction he had been in. It was not far from the city, and the time of the day was noon, for he had an occasion offered him by the custom of the country of doing what recommended his virtue, and afforded him an opportunity of bettering his circumstances. For that country, having but little water, the shepherds used to seize on the wells before the others came, lest their flocks should want water, and lest it should be spent by others before they came. 
There were now come, therefore, to this well seven sisters that were virgins, the daughters of Raguel, a priest, and one thought worthy by the people of the country of great honor. These virgins, who took care of their father's flocks, which sort of work it was customary and very familiar for women to do in the country of the Troglodytes, they came first of all and drew water out of the well in a quantity sufficient for their flocks into troughs which were made for the reception of that water. But when the shepherds came upon the maidens and drove them away that they might have the command of that water themselves, Moses, thinking it would be a terrible reproach upon him if he overlooked the young women under unjust oppression and should suffer the violence of the men to prevail over the right of the maidens, he drove away the men who had a mind to more than their share and afforded a proper assistance to the women, who when they had received such a benefit from him, came to their father and told him how they had been affronted by the shepherds and assisted by a stranger, and entreated that he would not let this generous action be done in vain, nor go without a reward. Now the father took it well from his daughters that they were so desirous to reward their benefactor, and to bid them bring Moses into his presence, that he might be rewarded as he deserved. And when Moses came, he told him what testimony his daughters bare to him, that he had assisted them, and that, as he admired him for his virtue, he said that Moses had bestowed such his assistance on persons not insensible of benefits, but where they were both able and willing to return the kindness, and even to exceed the measure of his generosity. So he made him his son, and gave him one of his daughters in marriage, and appointed him to be the guardian and superintendent over his cattle. For of old, all the wealth of the barbarians was in those cattle. Chapter 12 Concerning the Burning Bush and the Rod of Moses Now Moses, when he had obtained the favor of Jethro, for that was one of the names of Raguel, stayed there and fed his flock. But some time afterward, taking his station at the mountain called Sinai, he drove his flocks thither to feed them. Now this is the highest of all the mountains thereabout, and the best for pasturage, and the herbage being there good, and it had not been before fed upon, because of the opinion men had that God dwelt there, the shepherds not daring to ascend up to it. And here it was that a wonderful prodigy happened to Moses, for a fire fed upon a thorn bush, yet did the green leaves and the flowers continue untouched, and the fire did not at all consume the fruit branches, although the flame was great and fierce. Moses was affrighted at this strange sight as it was to him, but he was still more astonished when the fire uttered a voice, and called to him by name, and spake words to him, by which it signified how bold he had been in venturing to come into a place whither no man had ever come before, because the place was divine, and advised him to remove a great way off from the flame, and to be contented with what he had seen, and though he were himself a good man, and the offspring of great men, yet that he should not pry any further, and he foretold to him that he should have glory and honor among men by the blessing of God upon him. He also commanded him to go away thence with confidence to Egypt, in order to his being the commander and conductor of the body of the Hebrews, and to his delivering his own people from the injuries they suffered there. For, said God, they shall inhabit this happy land which your forefather Abraham inhabited, and shall have the enjoyment of all sorts of good things, and thou, by thy prudence, shalt guide them to those good things, but still he enjoined them, when he had brought the Hebrews out of the land of Egypt to come to that place, and to offer sacrifices of thanksgiving there. Such were the divine oracles which were delivered out of the fire. But Moses was astonished at what he saw, and much more at what he heard, and he said, I think it would be an instance of too great madness, O Lord, for one of that regard I bear to thee, to distrust thy power, since I myself adore it, and know that it has been made manifest to my progenitors. But I am still in doubt how I, who am a private man, and one of no abilities, should either persuade my countrymen to leave the country they now inhabit, and to follow me to a land whither I lead them, or if they should be persuaded, how can I force Pharaoh to permit them to depart, since they augment their own wealth and prosperity by the labors and works they put upon them? But God persuaded him to be courageous on all occasions, and promised to be with him, and to assist him in his words when he was to persuade men and in his deeds when he was to perform wonders. He bid him also to take a signal of the truth of what he said by throwing his rod upon the ground, which when he had done, it crept along and was become a serpent, and rolled itself round in its folds, and erected its head, as ready to revenge itself on such as should assault it, after which it became a rod again as before. After this, God bid Moses to put his right hand into his bosom. He obeyed, and when he took it out, it was white and in color like to chalk, but afterward 
it returned to its wonted color again. He also, upon God's command, took some of the water that was near him, and poured it upon the ground, and saw the color was that of blood. Upon the wonder that Moses showed at these signs, God exhorted him to be of good courage, and to be assured that he would be the greatest support to him, and bid him make use of those signs in order to obtain belief among all men, that thou art sent by me, and dost all things according to my commands. Accordingly, I enjoin thee to make no more delays, but to make haste to Egypt, and to travel night and day, and not to draw out the time, and so make the slavery of the Hebrews and their sufferings to last the longer. Moses, having now seen and heard these wonders, that assured him of the truth of these promises of God, had no room left him to disbelieve them. He entreated him to grant him that power when he should be in Egypt, and besought him to vouchsafe him the knowledge of his own name, and since he had heard and seen him, that he would also tell him his name, that when he offered sacrifice, he might invoke him by such his name in his oblations. Whereupon God declared to him his holy name, which had never been discovered to men before, concerning which it is not lawful for me to say any more. Now these signs accompanied Moses, not then only, but always when he prayed for them, of all which signs he attributed the firmest ascent to the fire in the bush, and believing that God would be a gracious supporter to him, he hoped he should be able to deliver his own nation and bring calamities on the Egyptians. Chapter 13 How Moses and Aaron Returned into Egypt to Pharaoh So Moses, when he understood that the Pharaoh, in whose reign he fled away, was dead, asked to leave Raguel to go to Egypt for the benefit of his own people, and he took with him Zipporah, the daughter of Raguel, whom he had married, and the children he had by her, Gersom and Eleazar, and made haste into Egypt. Now the former of those names, Gersom, in the Hebrew tongue, signifies that he was in a strange land, and Eleazar, that by the assistance of the God of his fathers, he had escaped from the Egyptians. Now when they were near the borders, Aaron his brother, by the command of God, met him, to whom he declared what had befallen him at the mountain, and the commands that God had given him. But as they were going forward, the chief men among the Hebrews, having learned that they were coming, met them, to whom Moses declared the signs he had seen, and while they could not believe them, he made them see them. So they took courage at these surprising and unexpected sights, and hoped well of their entire deliverance, as believing now that God took care of their preservation. Since then Moses found that the Hebrews would be obedient to whatsoever he should direct, as they promised to be, and were in love with liberty, he came to the king, who had indeed but lately received the government, and told him how much he had done for the good of the Egyptians when they were despised by the Ethiopians, and their country laid waste by them, and how he had been the commander of their forces, and had labored for them as if they had been his own people, and he informed him in what danger he had been during that expedition without having any proper returns made him as he had deserved. He also informed him distinctly what things happened to him at Mount Sinai, and what God said to him, and the signs that were done by God in order to assure him of the authority of these commands which he had given him. He also exhorted him not to disbelieve what he told him, nor to oppose the will of God. But when the king derided Moses, he made him in earnest see the signs that were done at Mount Sinai, Yet was the king very angry with him, and called him an ill man who had formerly run away from his Egyptian slavery, and came now back with deceitful tricks and wonders and magical arts to astonish him. And when he had said this, he commanded the priests to let him see the same wonderful sights, as knowing the Egyptians were skillful in this kind of learning, and that he was not the only person who knew them, and pretended them to be divine. As also he told him that when he brought such wonderful sights before him, he would only be believed by the unlearned. Now when the priests threw down their rods, they became serpents. But Moses was not daunted at it, and said, O king, I do not myself despise the wisdom of the Egyptians, but I say that what I do is so much superior to what these do by magic arts and tricks, as divine power exceeds the power of man. But I will demonstrate that what I do is not done by my craft, or counterfeiting what is not really true, but that they appear by the providence and power of God. And when he had said this, he cast his rod down upon the ground and commanded it to turn itself into a serpent. It obeyed him and went all round and devoured the rods of the Egyptians, which seemed to be dragons, until it had consumed them all. It then returned to its own form, and Moses took it into his hand again. However, the king was no more moved when this was done than before, 
and being very angry, he said that he should gain nothing by this his cunning and shrewdness against the Egyptians, and he commanded him that was the chief taskmaster over the Hebrews, to give them no relaxation from their labors, but to compel them to submit to greater oppressions than before. And though he allowed them chaff before for making their bricks, he would allow it them no longer. But he made them to work hard at brick-making in the daytime, and to gather chaff in the night. Now when their labor was thus doubled upon them, they laid the blame upon Moses, because their labor and their misery were on his account become more severe to them. But Moses did not let his courage sink for the king's threatenings, nor did he abate of his zeal on account of the Hebrews' complaints. But he supported himself, and set his soul resolutely against them both, and used his own utmost diligence to procure liberty to his countrymen. So he went to the king, and persuaded him to let the Hebrews to Mount Sinai, and there to sacrifice to God, because God had enjoined them so to do. He persuaded him also not to counterwork the designs of God, but to esteem his favor above all things, and to permit them to depart, lest before he be aware he lay an obstruction in the way of the divine commands, and so occasion his own suffering such punishments as it was probable anyone that counterworked the divine commands should undergo, since the severest afflictions arise from every object to those that provoke the divine wrath against them. For such as these have neither the earth nor the air for their friends, nor are the fruits of the womb according to nature, but everything is unfriendly and adverse towards them. He said further that the Egyptians should know this by sad experience, and that besides, the Hebrew people should go out of their country without their consent. Chapter 14 Concerning the Ten Plagues Which Came Upon the Egyptians But when the king despised the words of Moses, and had no regard at all to them, grievous plagues seized the Egyptians, every one of which I will describe, both because no such plagues did ever happen to any other nation as the Egyptians now felt, and because I would demonstrate that Moses did not fail in any one thing that he foretold them, and because it is for the good of mankind that they may learn this caution, not to do anything that may displease God, lest he be provoked to wrath and avenge their iniquities upon them. For the Egyptian river ran with bloody water at the command of God, insomuch that it could not be drunk, and they had no other spring of water neither. For the water was not only of the color of blood, but it brought upon those that ventured to drink it great pains and bitter torment. Such was the river to the Egyptians, but it was sweet and fit for drinking to the Hebrews, and no way different from what it naturally used to be. As the king therefore knew not what to do in these surprising circumstances, and was in fear for the Egyptians, he gave the Hebrews leave to go away. But when the plague ceased, he changed his mind again, and would not suffer them to go. But when God saw that he was ungrateful, and upon the ceasing of this calamity would not grow wiser, he sent another plague upon the Egyptians. An innumerable multitude of frogs consumed the fruit of the ground. The river was also full of them, insomuch that those who drew water had it spoiled by the blood of these animals, as they died in and were destroyed by the water. And the country was full of filthy slime, as they were born and as they died. Also spoiled their vessels in their houses, which they used and were found among what they eat and what they drank, and came in great numbers upon their beds. There was also an ungrateful smell, and a stink arose from them, as they were born and as they died therein. Now when the Egyptians were under the oppression of these miseries, the king ordered Moses to take the Hebrews with him, and be gone. Upon which, the whole multitude of the frogs vanished away, and both the land and the river returned to their former natures. But as soon as Pharaoh saw the land freed from this plague, he forgot the cause of it, and retained the Hebrews. And as though he had a mind to try the nature of more such judgments, he would not yet suffer Moses and his people to depart, having granted that liberty rather out of fear than out of any good consideration. Accordingly, God punished his falseness with another plague added to the former, for there arose out of the bodies of the Egyptians an innumerable quantity of lice, by which, wicked as they were, they miserably perished, as not able to destroy this sort of vermin either with washes or with ointments, at which terrible judgment the king of Egypt was in disorder, upon the fear into which he reasoned himself, lest his people should be destroyed, and that the manner of this death was also reproachful, so that he was forced in part to recover himself from his wicked temper to a sounder mind, for he gave leave for the Hebrews themselves to depart. But when the plague thereupon ceased, he thought it proper to require that they should leave their children and wives behind them, as pledges of their return, whereby he provoked God to be more vehemently angry at him, as if he thought to impose on his providence, and as if it were only Moses and not God who punished the Egyptians for the sake of the Hebrews. For he filled that country, full of various sorts of pestilential creatures, with their various properties, 
such indeed as had never come into the sight of men before, by whose means the men perished themselves, and the land was destitute of husbandmen for its cultivation. But if anything escaped destruction from them, it was killed by a distemper which the men underwent also. But when Pharaoh did not even then yield to the will of God, but while he gave leave to the husbands to take their wives with them, yet insisted that the children should be left behind, God presently resolved to punish his wickedness with several sorts of calamities, and those worse than the foregoing, which yet had so generally afflicted them, for their bodies had terrible boils, breaking forth with blains, while they were already inwardly consumed, and a great part of the Egyptians perished in this manner. But when the king was not brought to reason by this plague, hail was sent down from heaven, and such hail it was, as the climate of Egypt had never suffered before, nor was it like to that which falls in other climates in winter time, but was larger than that which falls in the middle of spring to those that dwell in the northern and northwestern regions. This hail broke down their bows laden with fruit. After this, a tribe of locusts consumed the seed which was not hurt by the hail, so that to the Egyptians all hopes of the future fruits of the ground were entirely lost. One would think that the forementioned calamities might have been sufficient for one that was only foolish without wickedness to make him wise and to make him sensible what was for his advantage. But Pharaoh, led not so much by his folly as by his wickedness, even when he saw the cause of his miseries, he still contested with God and willfully deserted the cause of virtue. So he bid Moses take the Hebrews away with their wives and children, but to leave their cattle behind since their own cattle were destroyed. But when Moses said that what he desired was unjust since they were obliged to offer sacrifices to God of those cattle, and the time being prolonged on this account, a thick darkness without the least light spread itself over the Egyptians, whereby their sight being obstructed and their breathing hindered by the thickness of the air, they died miserably under a terror lest they should be swallowed up by the dark cloud. Besides this, when the darkness after three days and as many nights was dissipated, and when Pharaoh did not still repent and let the Hebrews go, Moses came to him and said, How long wilt thou be disobedient to the command of God? For he enjoins thee to let the Hebrews go. Nor is there any other way of being freed from the calamities you are under, unless you do so. But the king was angry at what he said, and threatened to cut off his head if he came any more to trouble him about these matters. Hereupon, Moses said he would not speak to him any more about them, for that he himself, together with the principal men among the Egyptians, should desire the Hebrews to go away. So when Moses had said this, he went his way. But when God had signified that with one more plague he would compel the Egyptians to let the Hebrews go, he commanded Moses to tell the people that they should have a sacrifice ready, and that they should prepare themselves on the tenth day of the month Xanthicus against the fourteenth, which month is called by the Egyptians Farmuth, and Nisan by the Hebrews, but the Macedonians call it Xanthicus, and that he should carry away the Hebrews with all they had. Accordingly, he having got the Hebrews ready for their departure, and having sorted the people into tribes, he kept them together in one place. But when the fourteenth day was come, and all were ready to depart, they offered the sacrifice and purified their houses with the blood, using bunches of hyssop for that purpose. And when they had supped, they burnt the remainder of the flesh as just ready to depart. Whence it is that we do still offer this sacrifice in like manner to this day, and call this festival Pasha, which signifies the Feast of Passover, because on that day God passed us over and sent the plague upon the Egyptians. For the destruction of the firstborn came upon the Egyptians that night, so that many of the Egyptians who lived near the king's palace persuaded Pharaoh to let the Hebrews go. Accordingly, he called for Moses and bid them be gone, as supposing that if once the Hebrews were gone out of the country, Egypt should be freed from its miseries. They also honored the Hebrews with gifts, some in order to get them to depart quickly, and others on account of their neighborhood and the friendship they had with them. Chapter 15 How the Hebrews, under the conduct of Moses, left Egypt. So the Hebrews went out of Egypt, while the Egyptians wept and repented that they had treated them so hardly. Now they took their journey by Letopolis, a place at that time deserted, but where Babylon was built afterwards when Cambyses laid Egypt waste. But as they went away hastily, on the third day they came to a place called Beelzephon, on the Red Sea, and when they had no food out of the land because it was a desert, they eat of loaves kneaded of flour only warmed by a gentle heat and this food they made use of for thirty days, for what they brought with them out of Egypt would not suffice them any longer time, and this only while they dispensed it to each person, to use so much only as would serve for necessity, but not for satiety. Whence it is, that in memory of the want we were then in, we keep a feast for eight days, which is called the Feast of Unleavened Bread. 
Now the entire multitude of those that went out, including the women and children, was not easy to be numbered, but those that were of age, fit for war, were six hundred thousand. They left Egypt in the month of Xanthicus, on the fifteenth day of the lunar month, four hundred and thirty years after our forefather Abraham came into Canaan, but two hundred and fifteen years only after Jacob removed into Egypt. It was the eightieth year of the age of Moses, and of that of Aaron, three more. They also carried out the bones of Joseph with them, as he had charged his sons to do. But the Egyptians soon repented that the Hebrews were gone, and the king also was mightily concerned that this had been procured by the magic arts of Moses, so they resolved to go after them. Accordingly, they took their weapons and other warlike furniture, and pursued after them in order to bring them back, if once they overtook them, because they would now have no pretense to pray to God against them, since they had already been permitted to go out and they thought they should easily overcome them, as they had no armor and would be weary with their journey. So they made haste in their pursuit, and asked of everyone they met which way they were gone. And indeed, that land was difficult to be traveled over, not only by armies, but by single persons. Now Moses led the Hebrews this way, that in case the Egyptians should repent and be desirous to pursue after them, they might undergo the punishment of their wickedness, and of the breach of those promises they had made to them. As also he led them this way on account of the Philistines, who had quarreled with them, and hated them of old, that by all means they might not know of their departure, for their country is near to that of Egypt. And thence it was that Moses led them not along the road that tended to the land of the Philistines, but he was desirous that they should go through the desert, so that after a long journey, and after many afflictions, they might enter upon the land of Canaan. Another reason of this was that God commanded him to bring the people to Mount Sinai, that there they might offer him sacrifices. Now when the Egyptians had overtaken the Hebrews, they prepared to fight them, and by their multitude they drove them into a narrow place, for the number that pursued after them was six hundred chariots, with fifty thousand horsemen, and two hundred thousand footmen, all armed. They also seized on the passages by which they imagined the Hebrews might fly, shutting them up between inaccessible precipices and the sea. For there was on each side a ridge of mountains that terminated at the sea, which were impassable by reason of their roughness, and obstructed their flight. Wherefore, they were pressed upon the Hebrews with their army, where the ridges of the mountains were closed with the sea, which army they placed at the chops of the mountains, so that they might deprive them of any passage into the plain. When the Hebrews, therefore, were neither able to bear up, being thus, as it were, besieged, because they wanted provisions, nor saw any possible way of escaping, and if they should have thought of fighting, they had no weapons, they expected a universal destruction unless they delivered themselves up to the Egyptians. So they laid the blame on Moses, and forgot all the signs that had been wrought by God for the recovery of their freedom, and this so far, that their incredulity prompted them to throw stones at the prophet, while he encouraged them, and promised them deliverance. And they resolved that they would deliver themselves up to the Egyptians. So there was sorrow and lamentation among the women and children, who had nothing but destruction before their eyes, while they were encompassed with mountains, the sea, and their enemies, and discerned no way of flying from them. But Moses, though the multitude looked fiercely at him, did not, however, give over the care of them, but despised all dangers out of his trust in God, who, as he had afforded them the several steps already taken for the recovery of their liberty which he had foretold them, would not now suffer them to be subdued by their enemies, to be either made slaves or slain by them, and standing in the midst of them, he said, It is not just of us to distrust even men, when they have hitherto well managed our affairs, as if they would not be the same men hereafter, but it is no better than madness, at this time, to despair of the providence of God, by whose power all those things have been performed which he promised, when you expected no such things. I mean all that I have been concerned in for your deliverance and escape from slavery. Nay, when we are in the utmost distress, as you see we are, we ought rather to hope that God will secure us, by whose operation it is, that we are now encompassed within this narrow place, that he may deliver us out of such difficulties as are otherwise insurmountable, and out of which neither you nor your enemies expect you can be delivered, and may at once demonstrate his own power and his providence over us. Nor does God use to give his help in small difficulties to those whom he favors, but in such cases where no one can see how any hope in man can better their condition. Depend, therefore, upon such a protector as is able to make small things great, and to show that his mighty force against you is nothing but weakness, and be not affrighted at the Egyptian army, nor do you despair of being preserved, because the sea before and the mountains behind afford you no opportunity for flying. For even these mountains, if God so please, may be made plain ground for you, and the sea become dry land. Chapter 16 How the sea was divided asunder for the Hebrews, 
when they were pursued by the Egyptians and so gave them an opportunity of escaping from them. When Moses had said this, he led them to the sea, while the Egyptians looked on, for they were within sight. Now these were so distressed by the toil of their pursuit that they thought proper to put off fighting till the next day. But when Moses was come to the seashore, he took his rod and made supplication to God and called upon him to be their helper and assistant and said, Thou art not ignorant, O Lord, that it is beyond human strength and human contrivance to avoid the difficulties we are now under, but it must be by thy work altogether to procure deliverance to this army which has left Egypt at thy appointment. We despair of any other assistance or contrivance and have recourse only to that hope we have in thee. And if there by any method that can promise us an escape by thy providence, we look up to thee for it. And let it come quickly and manifest thy power to us. And do thou raise up this people unto good courage and hope of deliverance who are deeply sunk into a disconsolate state of mind. We are in a helpless place, but still it is a place that thou possessest. Still the sea is thine. The mountains also that enclose us are thine so that these mountains will open themselves if thou commandest them, and the sea also, if thou commandest it, will become dry land. Nay, we might escape by a flight through the air, if thou shouldest determine we should have that way of salvation. When Moses had thus addressed himself to God, he smote the sea with his rod, which parted asunder at the stroke, and receiving those waters into itself, left the ground dry, as a road and a place of flight for the Hebrews. Now when Moses saw this appearance of God, and that the sea went out of its own place and left dry land, he went first of all into it and bid the Hebrews to follow him along that divine road and to rejoice at the danger their enemies that followed them were in and gave thanks to God for this so surprising a deliverance which appeared from him. Now while these Hebrews made no stay but went on earnestly as led by God's presence with them, the Egyptians supposed at first that they were distracted and were going rashly upon manifest destruction. But when they saw that they were going a great way without any harm, and that no obstacle or difficulty fell in their journey, they made haste to pursue them, hoping that the sea would be calm for them also. They put their horse foremost, and went down themselves into the sea. Now the Hebrews, while these were putting on their armor and therein spending their time, were beforehand with them, and escaped them, and got first over to the other side without any hurt. Whence the others were encouraged, and more courageously pursued them, as hoping no harm would come to them neither, but the Egyptians were not aware that they went into a road made for the Hebrews and not for others, that this road was made for the deliverance of those in danger, but not for those that were earnest to make use of it for the others' destruction. As soon, therefore, as ever the whole Egyptian army was within it, the sea flowed to its own place and came down with a torrent raised by storms of wind and encompassed the Egyptians. Showers of rain also came down from the sky and dreadful thunders and lightning with flashes of fire. Thunderbolts also were darted upon them, nor was there anything which used to be sent by God upon men as indications of his wrath which did not happen at this time, for a dark and dismal night oppressed them. And thus did all these men perish, so that there was not one man left to be a messenger of this calamity to the rest of the Egyptians. But the Hebrews were not able to contain themselves for joy at their wonderful deliverance and destruction of their enemies. Now indeed, supposing themselves firmly delivered, when those that would have forced them into slavery were destroyed, and when they found they had God so evidently for their protector, and now these Hebrews, having escaped the danger they were in, after this manner, and besides that, seeing their enemies punished in such a way as is never recorded of any other men whomsoever, were all the night employed in singing of hymns and in mirth. Moses also composed a song unto God, containing his praises and a thanksgiving for his kindness, in a hexameter verse. As for myself, I have delivered every part of this history as I found it in the sacred books, nor let anyone wonder at the strangeness of the narration, if a way were discovered to those men of old time who were free from the wickedness of the modern ages, whether it happened by the will of God or whether it happened of its own accord, while for the sake of those that accompanied Alexander, king of Macedonia, who yet lived comparatively but a little while ago, the Pamphylian Sea retired and afforded them a passage through itself when they had no other way to go, I mean, when it was the will of God to destroy the monarchy of the Persians, and this is confessed to be true by all that have written about the actions of Alexander, but as to these events, let every one determine as he pleases. On the next day, Moses gathered together the weapons of the Egyptians, which were brought to the camp of the Hebrews by the current of the sea and the force of the winds assisting it, and he conjectured that this also happened by divine providence, so that they might not be destitute of weapons. So when he had ordered the Hebrews to arm themselves with them, 
he led them to Mount Sinai in order to offer sacrifice to God and to render oblations for the salvation of the multitude as he was charged to do beforehand. End of Book 2